think you ought to clap your hands again and lift your voice and worship the one who's made the difference in your life, who's brought you out of darkness into this marvelous life. I walk in true salvation because of what Jesus did for me. His grace and mercy extended to me. Doesn't it feel wonderful on this beautiful Sunday morning? Drizzling rain and raining in the spirit inside the house. Thank the Lord for it. How many of you had a great Thanksgiving? Did you enjoy your family? I'm glad to see that you're not too full, that you came back for more. And that's always a good thing. It's always good to come back for more. How many of you want more of Jesus? On December the 12th and the 19th on Sunday evening at 6 p.m., we're going to be having our musical drama, Hope Has a Name. And how many of you know that name? Now, those two Sunday nights are not for you to choose which one you want to come to. I want you to be here at both, but I want you to invite people to come because that's a great way to introduce them to our church. It's a little bit easier sometimes to convince them and persuade them to come. They can hear the gospel message and they can receive that gospel message. And then on December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, if you did not know that, we're going to be having a children's program here, and we would love to have all of you attend and invite as many people as you can to be a part of that. Everyone enjoys and loves to see children sing about Jesus. How many of you know that Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me? That's just the word of God, so we're just going to allow that here in the on Christmas Eve, and that, of course, will be also at 6 p.m. So just remember those announcements. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12. 21 and verse 12. Now, consider this. Jesus went into the temple of God. Now, notice what he did. He acted completely out of character cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money chambers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now my question is, now I understand the prophetic word from Isaiah 56, 7 that talks about my house shall be a house of prayer. And also in another instance when he cast out the money chambers uh, he was fulfilling the text in Psalms, I believe it's 89 and 9, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. But why is it that he chose this method to fulfill those prophecies? Why? It's a very interesting question to ask yourself as you study scripture because it's very easy to miss the reason. Because he did not get up that morning and say, you know what, I forgot, I got to go fulfill that prophecy in Isaiah 56, 7. And if I don't get that done, then I'm not really Messiah. So I've got to go take care of business. No, that's not the reason why. As a matter of fact, verse 14 tells you the reason why, but don't look at it just yet. Some of you already got your face in the word. You want to know so bad. Did they already put it on the screen? No, they didn't. Praise God. <laughs> See, he had a reason for doing it that way. Because he was not there to fulfill a prophecy, although he was there to fulfill his purpose. And the prophecy was just a consequence of him fulfilling his purpose. Praise today is not my purpose. It's just a consequence of my purpose. My purpose is to bring the presence of the Lord into this place. It's a consequence. And so, in the original language, verse 14 says, Now, I've got room to work. I've got room for the blind and the crippled to get in here so I can heal them. 
now. He was making room so he could have a healing campaign. I wonder how much God's got to move out of our lives in order to fulfill his original intention and purpose of why he's here. And that's the reason why. Why is it that the Jewish religion at that time, and I don't want Pentecost to become like the Jewish religion of his day, they had no room for the broken. No room for the broken. All those weird people that are messed up and dysfunctional. We want Jesus to save people as long as we like them. As long as they're nice people and they're not messed up and they're not dysfunctional. Hey, I'm for you. Bring them. You can't find them. You'll never bring anybody to church because everybody I know of that's coming to church that don't know Jesus is ever more messed up. But I serve a Savior that specializes in healing the broken. I just want to ask you a question. Is there room for the broken in the house? Is there room for the dysfunctional in the house? Is there room for the hurting, for the blind, and for the lame? I think Jesus wants to heal somebody in this place. Is there room for people whose marriages are messed up? Jesus knew why he was there. And some of us have lost the why. When you lose the why, it really makes it difficult to come to church, doesn't it? When you're not here for the right reason. Sure does make it difficult. But it sure does make it easy. I mean, it's easy to come in here and worship the Lord and throw down for Jesus when you know why you're here. Hey, a drug addict can get delivered. An alcoholic can be delivered. A manic depressed person can be delivered. Anxiety can be healed in this house because I serve that kind of God. So, that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to make room for the broken. They can interrupt this service and come and find Jesus anytime they want to. Press your way through the crowd. Touch the hem of his garment and be made whole. Make room for the broken. God bless you. You may be seated. In Matthew's gospel, we read that once the temple had been cleansed, the blind and the lame came to Jesus so that they could be healed. I believe that Jesus was saying that if we'll make room for it, he'll do the work. If we'll make room for it, he will accomplish what no one else can accomplish. But it's, we've got to make room in our schedule. We've got to make room in our programs. We've got to make room in our own lives. The uncomfortableness of people that don't function at the same high level that we do who have been in church and have been blessed of the Lord. They don't function at that same high level, but because of whatever sin and trouble that is in their life, they function at a much lower level. But yet Jesus loves them and he died on the cross for their sin. Man is born to struggle, but man is also born to dream, to dream that he could be more, to dream that he could become what God wants him to be. I like what D.A. Carson said, the appeal to God's sovereignty is not to foster hope that we will be spared all difficulty, but to foster confidence that when those difficulties come, we are not abandoned, but the divine design will work them for our good in our lives. He designs seemingly chance encounters that usher in that dream. He opens doors and he shuts them and he sets the stage and he empties the stage. He turns the limelight of his favor upon us and then the clouds shroud that light. But yet we walk on to know that there is a reason and a purpose for it all. Obstacles and detours are all the tools of God's trade and he knows exactly what he is doing because he is the divine designer of eternal dreams. He is the sovereign Lord and he knows that all of these difficulties prepare us for the larger stage before us. Here's what I found, church, and I'm just going to share with you the lessons that I've learned. Every dream I've ever had has a price tag. 
The currency of purchasing dreams is not coinage, but it's carnage. Solomon's dream required sacrifice. The dream of the church cost Jesus his own blood. No one said it was going to be easy, but it is worth it. It may not have been easy to get up this morning and come to church and face the world with whatever dysfunction you've got working in your life, but it's worth it. It may not seem like it's easy to clap your hands and worship the Lord because of whatever reason there might be, but it's worth it. But I'm being reproached because I'm coming to a Pentecostal church. It's worth it. It might be a price you have to pay, but it's worth it to be able to touch the divine presence of God in this place. It's worth it. It's worth it even when you're hurting, even when you got a headache, even when you're, uh, you got problems physically to come on to the house of the Lord because you never know when the healer's going to come walking down the dusty road and through those double doors and he walked down the aisles of this church uh, and God can heal you in an instant. He can send forth his word and heal. Yeah. Joseph found out why God had done all the stuff he'd done to him whenever he ascended to the second in command in Egypt. And a lot of people preach Joseph's dreams wrong. They really do. They don't have the scriptural nor the understanding of what God was doing. It really didn't have anything to do with him experiencing the fulfillment of his dreams. I know that if you come to God, he'll fulfill your dreams. Well, maybe so and maybe not. Because it wasn't about the dream. It wasn't even about forgiving his brethren, even though he did that and he had the quality. It wasn't about him turning down Potiphar's wife in Potiphar's house. It wasn't about him doing a good job in the prison. That's not the reason why he was there. He was there to preserve a seed for Israel and birth Messiah into the world. And he knew that the only way we can accomplish that purpose, I have to forgive, I have to ascend the throne, I got to take the prison, I got to go through all of this mess, I got to get through all of that in order to accomplish God's real reason for me to be here. My real reason for being here is to see you saved. My real reason for you being here is to lay down your offenses and your wounds and your pain and say, I found out the reason why I'm here. It's easy to forgive when you know why you're here. It's easy to walk through the darkness when you know why you're here. I know there's light somewhere because the Bible says God is light, so I'm going to keep following him and hold to that nail-scarred hand because one day the light's going to shine into the darkness and the darkness will not comprehend it. I know some of you are on a detour. I know some of you may be placed in a prison and you feel like you should be in the palace, but God has you exactly where he wants you. And if you'll learn how to develop your character and your attitude to match your purpose, uh, I believe that God will fulfill his purpose in your life. He will not abandon you. He will not leave you. Some of you have even said this week you feel that God has forsaken you. And I've come to declare to you that is not true. It is a lie from hell. God has not forsaken you. You might be in a dire strait, but that strait right where you're at is for your greatest benefit and blessing. What God's denied you has saved your soul, and you don't have enough wisdom to know what it is yet. But I say hold to that nail-scarred hand and don't let it go, church. I wish somebody would hear this message and receive the spirit that I'm preaching to you that you don't have to worry about whether or not you're in the will of God. Great dreams require great attitudes. I still got an attitude of thanksgiving. I still have an attitude of praise because I may not know what God's doing right now, but I know he's got a purpose. Here's where Pentecost has gone astray in many cases because I've seen it happen so many times and so many of my friends, I've had to talk them out of this. I've had to talk them out of it. I don't know how many times. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But because somebody who was great prophesied in their life, they thought that prophecy was going to automatically come to pass without any contribution on their own part. 
And they thought it was going to be easy sailing because the superstar prophesied and said, I was going to be this and I was going to be that and I was going to do this. And, and now I'm going to be honest with you. I honestly believe that everything that was said was true and from God. I believed every word that prophet said that God had spoken into their life. But because their attitude wasn't as great as their dream Mm. And, and you can't come to church to say, well, my purpose is to have a great attitude. No, because it doesn't work that way. It's got to be a consequence of you coming here for the real reason to bring the presence of the Lord into this place. You see, I may not be able to see the hundred get the Holy Ghost, but if I can get the one, I'm going to focus on the one because that's why I'm here. Oh, no, there's only one. Well, then that's just not enough for me. I've got to have more than one. Well, Jesus said he'll go after the one lost sheep and leave the 99 and you brothers back at the stable. Leave you up in the pen, locked up for the night. I'm going after the one. I'll find the one. If I can find the one, that's worth it all to me. If you could find the one that could be touched by the feelings of our infirmities and understand what we're going through, there's room for the broken at the cross. There's room in my busy life. Quit trying to fixate on trying to fix everybody in the world. And why don't you come up in here and find out why you're here. And why are you walking with Jesus? Woo! I'm walking with Jesus for a reason. Church holiness is easy when you know why you're here. Praise is easy when you know why you're here. Serving God is easy when you know why you're here. I know there are dream stealers and thieves, and there are people that will take your purpose away from you. There are deep valleys of postponement and discouragement. And I know it seems like those discouragements can bury your dreams and keep them from being resurrected. But when the dream seems to be on life support, that's when we got to determine how serious we are about seeing it coming to pass. That's when Abraham steps into the midst of a covenant sacrifice that God told him to sacrifice. God set it up, and there was a big smoking furnace that came down, and there was a burning lamp in the midst of that smoking furnace. But while he was in that covenant sacrifice, the Bible says he beat the vultures of the air away because he knew that even though there's a smoking furnace and it's delayed 400 years before it's going to come to pass, I have confidence confidence that God's purpose is going to come to pass and I want to be in on it. That's the reason why he built, he, 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 he drove those vultures away and the beast of the field away is because he knew I've got a covenant promise. I've got a covenant blessing and I want to see it come to pass, not just for myself, but for the next generation coming up. I've got some young people. I want them to see a miracle. I want them to see the lame come up out of wheelchairs. Church, you're not going to convince them with a rule book that they need to serve God in this generation. But when we get blinded eyes opening up and lame people walking and people getting healed and Jesus saving people, it'll keep them when nothing else will. Hey Amen. Rispa clung to that tiniest thread of hope, even though her five sons were killed by divine order from a king in order to stay a plague and a famine upon the people. She beat the fowls of the air away by day and the beast by night because if, if they were hung on a tree, they were cursed. And if they were cursed, they were not allowed to be buried. But she had a covenant with God. These are my babies. And I want them to have a proper burial. She couldn't resurrect them. And she didn't have faith or confidence that God would resurrect them. But she still said, I can have honor in this hour. And I can bring honor to God by seeing them buried in a tomb. And finally, David heard about it. And he said, I want you to violate the law. Go take them down from the tree, and I want you to bury them properly. And I want you to give them the proper burial. Because the mama said, I'm not going to give up. 
I just want to know, are there any mamas in the house that aren't going to give up? You're not going to give up when the going gets tough. You're not going to give up when you don't feel like it. You're not going to give up. My, 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 my. Job faced the loss and the destruction of everything, but he declared, as I say it today, I know that my Redeemer lives. Church, I know Jesus is alive. And there's one thing I know about him. He can heal any sickness. He can, de he can defeat any devil. He can overthrow any situation in your life. It's not too far gone. It's not too far out. Come on up in the house. I don't care who's in the way. We'll overthrow the money changers to make room for the broken. I said, we'll make room for the broken. You don't have to be perfect to be in this church. You don't have to be like the elite to be in this church. You can be messed up and still be in the house and worship God. So bring your broken dreams. Trust me, the thief comes to steal and to kill you if it's possible. Here's the fourth Dream killer. The price and the process overwhelms your passion because everybody starts with passion. The prophetic word is spoken. God's going to do this. God's going to do that. Hallelujah. But he don't show you the prison. He don't show you people mocking you. He doesn't show people reproaching you. He doesn't show you all of that. He just shows you, this is going to be what I want to do in your life. I want to I want to use you. Hallelujah. And anybody can feel it on a Sunday night. I mean, when the choir's boom, 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 boom. I got a prophetic word from a superstar. I'm going to make it. And we, we got all of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what about in the wee hours of the morning? When somebody's mocking you, listen, I've bore the reproach for years because of my worship and my belief in revival and my preaching it. I'm talking about it, Pentecostal churches. You read it in Psalms 89. It's the truth. Read it. That reproach comes upon us because of what we believe in. And I don't quit believing in it just because somebody else mocks it. I'm not saying it's not painful. I'm not saying that I'm bulletproof. I'm just simply saying I'm going to keep on keeping on uh, even though they don't like it. I'm going to preach holiness when everybody else says it's not supposed to be done and it can't be done in this hour. I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to wrap my dream in prayer. I'm going to wrap my dream in passion. I'm going to wrap it in purpose uh, because I believe that it's got to become the very fiber of this church. It ought to be impervious to criticism and doubt and persecution. Setbacks are God's preferred method to reposition us for greater glory. Low points causes us to change ladders. You're, you're climbing on the wrong ladder and God wants you to go to another ladder so you can climb higher. In that prison, Joseph would have come in contact with two people from Pharaoh and God used his ministry and his anointing to interpret their dreams. One was killed, one was restored. God fulfilled someone else's dream through his anointing while he left him in the prison. <laughs> have you ever had that happen to you where God used you to help somebody else find what they want and you're still lost in the prison? Wondering when in the world God's going to do something in my life. But you know what? It's easy to do that. It's easy to interpret somebody. Oh, I, I, you know, he didn't even hesitate. He didn't say, now, God, if you'll do it for him, you'll do it for me and all of that. He did ask him. He said, now, when you come into your kingdom, please remember me, you know, and send me a tithe check. Praise God. <laughs> You're restored and I'm still in prison. Send me the tithes. I'm, I'm happy. No, he didn't do all of that. But what he did do is say, God, this is where you put me. I don't understand it, but I know why I'm here. I got to preserve a seed for Israel. I got to see somebody saved. I got to see somebody talk in tongues. It's worth it to me 
to go through any offense, to walk through any valley, to go through any dark time in order to get to the purpose because there's always room for the broken. And you know one thing that it does that I have found is that when I go through it, then I know what to tell people when they're going through it. I can sit them down and say, yeah, I've been through that, like Brother Tenney used to do to us all the time, just aggravate the ever-loving. Yes, I remember, Brian, back in 1945, on April the 6th at 7.30 a.m., I went through the same thing. I've, I've heard it so many different times, but yet that's experience speaking to you from the from the cloudy veil, and behind that veil are hidden a lot of feelings and a lot of hurt and a lot of pain, but yet it did not quit and it did not deny them their purpose. They kept on going even in the cloudiness of the smoking furnace uh, that produced nothing but smoke and I can't see which way I'm going. But the Spirit had inspired them that no matter what I'm going through, there is going to be a purpose of which God is going to be glorified. And I'd rather God be glorified in this house than anybody else. I want Jesus to be glorified glorified. Church, I believe when the stripes were placed on the, his back, they were placed on, on his back for your healing, Cindy. It's complete. I declare it in the name of Jesus. God wants the broken. God wants the hurting. Woo! Hallelujah! Mark, I believe Jesus died on the cross for you, and I believe that that blood can wash and cleanse every sin away, and he can lift you to whatever level his purpose is. The rest of you quit moaning and groaning because of what you're going through and say, I've got a dream, and I've got a hope, and I've got a desire. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not here just to play an instrument. I'm here to bring the presence here. I'm not here just to preach. I'm here to bring the presence in this house. God wants to heal the broken. Woo! Somebody praise the Lord in this house. Not because I'm asking you to, but because you've got a vision. The birth of Jesus was accompanied by many dreams and visions. Joseph dreamed, shepherds had an angelic vision, Simeon and Anna in the temple were told by the Spirit they would see the Christ child. And as the curtains of this age draw to a close, in anticipations of Jesus Christ's second return, I believe you can expect more dreams and visitations and prophetic words. Dreamers of great dreams share many qualities with us today. Many dreamers. I think if you're going to have a dream and God's going to fulfill it, you need a firm conviction that God's at work now. Does anybody see God working now? Well, I just don't see what God's doing. Then you need your eyes open. Because according to my understanding of Scripture, God knows exactly what he is doing. Everybody I've ever seen get through something. They had a firm conviction that even though they did not understand fully, but God is at work. They didn't stay home and binge on Netflix. They didn't run around and commit a bunch of sin to try to justify their feelings and try to medicate their pain, but they had a firm conviction. I may not understand what God's doing, but God's at work. I don't know if you recognize it, but COVID-19, the hand of the Lord is working through all of that. Why not an apostolic church rise up with a healing in its wings? Why not but somebody with a prophetic word of healing speak into somebody's life? God can overcome anything. You know, I'm hearing story and story and story concerning denominations all over America that are having a struggle coming back from COVID. Do you want to know why this church has not struggled as they're struggling? It's not just because we preach the truth, but it's because we have a true identity of why we are here and who we are. And I'm preaching so we don't lose that. I'm preaching that you'll make room. If somebody bursts through those doors there and they're all messed up and they're all painted up or they're all whatever they are, they can walk in here and find Jesus. Uh, that we would stop everything. Stop the music. Stop the preaching. Stop. Because we're here to heal the broken. 
I don't care what the I don't care if they smell like an alcoholic. God can change it in an instant. You got to have a firm conviction that God's at work now. Not wait. He's at work now. Another thing I've seen them do, I've seen Brother Tenney do this, I've seen others. Don't cling to the past. If you're holding on to the past, you can't move into your future. The past is a dead weight that will keep you from your future. You can't cling to the past. You can't change the past, but you sure can't forgive it or you can repent of it and move on. So I say, forgive it and repent of it and let's move on. I've always seen them do this. They refuse to give up. They don't give up no matter what it is. Life is like wrestling a gorilla. You don't quit when you're tired. You quit when the gorilla gets tired. So you keep on wrestling the gorilla. And how many of you are wrestling the gorilla in this house? You might be wrestling a gorilla, but don't quit, don't give up. Don't turn away from your purpose. Don't let anything sidetrack you. Don't let anything give you a bad attitude. Don't let anything stop. There is no prophetic word. There's nothing I can do to pray you into a future that God has prepared for you if your attitude's not right. I couldn't do that if I wanted to. It doesn't make any difference who prophesies over you. You still have to have the right attitude to be able to to fulfill whatever God's wanting to produce in your life. So I say, church, refuse to give up. I say, grab a hold of Jesus and say, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. <laughs> Woo! My, 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 my. Something is in this house. I said, something is in this house and God's ready to do something in your life. Refuse to give up. Go ahead and let him run. He needs a healing today. He didn't just come to sit down and listen to your little denominational lesson. God is here in the power of his presence to change somebody's life. Woo! Sata Maharia. Somebody needs to be healed today. They're broken. Refuse to give up. Refuse to give up. I want you to see the opportunity and stay focused on the solution. I want you to exercise personal responsibility and realize that self-pity and victimization will never allow you the privilege to get loose from your past long enough to see anything God's going to do in anybody's life. And if you do see it, you won't even be able to recognize it because you'll begin to criticize it. So you got to accept your own personal responsibility. Get up out the foxhole of self-pity. Get up out of the tomb of your victimization and say, I might be in a predicament. I'm not saying you're not in a predicament because we all get in predicaments. Can you even say that real fat predicament? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm in a predicament and you are the predicament. <laughs> no, do not do that. You are my predicament right there, right there. You're in it, but you can't change nobody. I've tried. I've tried to change myself and had a hard time. I can't change anybody. The only thing I know to do is be what God called me to be and do what God called me to do. Over 200 years ago in Naples, Italy, a man by the name of Luigi was working for a local opera. And in the course of his work, he repaired and repainted a few of the puppets that were used on stage. And he left those repaired puppets outside for them to cure and to dry so that they would be presentable whenever they were used by those that acted on stage. Passerbys noticed these puppets and they remember all of their keepsakes that they used to have that had become broken through the years, treasures from their childhood, heirlooms that were precious to them, handed down through generations. Each had been broken and each needed to be repaired. And so they all came and brought their broken toys and their broken heirlooms to Luigi 250 something years ago. They called it the doll hospital and he would fix them up and he would make them look all good. As a matter of fact, that hospital is still open today in Naples, Italy. You can go there 
And the descendants of Luigi, after all of these years, is still taking broken limbs and broken toys and broken heirlooms and turning them into masterpieces because of the restoration. And this is what he says, I repair objects of love. People come here to have their broken dreams restored. Whew. Oh my, that's what needs to be said about this church. D.L. Welch started it many years ago. Paul Welch carried on the mission. Brian Kinsey doing everything he can to keep it going. And I just wanna know, can we pass it on to the next generation and the next? And the next. We got Sister Perkins here. She's, I don't know how old she is, but she's old. We got Cindy in the house. We got all kinds of people. Christine's in the house. It just keeps coming and getting better and better and better because God is wanting our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to have what we have. I remember going to the campgrounds and believing God for end time revival. I have never changed that vision all of my life. I have preached it. I have lived it. I have ate it, slept it, breathed it. I believe it that God still is going to do it. Even if he doesn't use me. And I'm telling you, God's at work right now. God's at work right now. Scott Stephen baptized somebody from his Bible study just yesterday or the day before or whenever it was through Thanksgiving. How in the world can you get your mind on baptism? When your purpose is right, you can do it. Thanksgiving is just nothing but another opportunity. We're going to baptize Brother Nathan Smith's two, two babies, two of them, one or two or three or eight or 22. I mean, I'll take them all, bring them all, praise God. We'll baptize everything. We're going to baptize them today. Why? Because it's going to be passed down from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. This is a hospital. I said, this is where broken people come. I said, well, they aren't straight yet. Well, sometimes it takes a little longer. Some people are more messed up than others. And some people have greater desire to get right than others. But we're going to keep on working. But what if somebody comes in and gets the Holy Ghost and walks away? I'm going to go to the next one. Kick the dust off my feet and go to the next house. What if somebody mocks you and says you're a bunch of crazy people? Many of you said that when you walked out, but you're here. <laughs> Woo! My! I don't know what it is about you people, but y'all just, I don't know. Y'all just turned the crank. And I'm, I was supposed to be real sweet and nice and tell that story all real nice about Luigi. But there's just something in this house. I can't resist it. There's purpose in this house. There's a reason for living in this house. I want you to stand. You need healing today. Some of you need your marriage healed. Some of you need your mind healed. Some of you need your emotions healed. Some of you need your heart healed. There's room for you. Oh no, brother kids, I've been down here 45 times and nothing's worked. I'd come 46. I wouldn't stop because the purpose is greater than my pain. The purpose is greater than my pain. The reason I'm here is greater than my pain. People are going to make fun of me if I come down there and get the Holy Ghost and speak with them. Most likely, yes. But it's worth the pain. I might be rejected. It's worth it. It's worth it. I didn't say it's going to be easy for you. I just said it's worth it. It's worth it to come in here 
and say, I've got a prophetic word on my life and I want to fulfill it. I wonder how many anointings I could awaken in this place if you would capture what I am saying. Jesus overturned the money changers. He used a method that was not prophesied to fulfill a principle that was prophesied for the one reason of making room so he could do what he came to do. That was his purpose. And he came to do it. That's the reason why he was there. And so now God is reaching for you, awakening something. Do you mean that after all these years I could still fulfill God's purpose? Absolutely. You're not too old. You're not too far gone. I'll never forget Elias Lamonis, great pastor friend of mine in San Francisco in that area. Pastor's a great church. God's given him tremendous revival. His dad is just was an awesome man. He's gone now to see Jesus. But he was sitting in Brother Lamonis, his son's office, and he was just saying, I'm 86 years old. He had cancer. He had stage four cancer. And he was 86 years old. And he says, I've got a vision of a million soul revival in San Francisco. I'm going to go start a church. <laughs> and Elias said, Dad, you're 8,600 years old. You, are, you got stage four cancer. How in the world? You? He said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but God can do it. That's the kind of fire I want in my spirit. Does anybody have that kind of fire in your heart? I might be 86, dying, but I believe God can still use to do a work for the Lord. In Jesus' name. God's calling some of you right now. There's room for the broken here. There's room for the broken. Do you want your anointing? Activated? Do you want your ministry restored? Do you want your mind healed, your body healed, your spirit healed, your marriage healed, your finances healed? What do you want from God? Walk out from wherever you might be standing and walk to the front. Our prayer warriors are here ready to receive you and to minister the word of God to you. Minister to you as we pray. Come you say, but I'm not Pentecostal. I didn't say you had to be Pentecostal to come up here. I'm just making room for the broken. Well, I'm not religious. I don't care whether you're religious or not. I'm making room for the broken. Come on up here. Find yourself up here and walk to this front so Jesus can help you and strengthen. Don't let your pride get in the way. Come on. Don't let the strangeness of the atmosphere, I understand that, strange people, strange church, strange this. I get all of that. I'm not wanting you to be uncomfortable. I want you to come. It was so powerful when I saw why Jesus was doing this using this method to fulfill a prophetic word is because the prophecy was not the main thing. The prophecy was a consequence. It was the fruit of the main thing. The main thing was healing. If you've got pain in your body, if you've got pain in your heart, if you've got pain in your spirit and in your emotions, I want you to lift your head and say, I'm here for a reason, and that is I need to be healed in my broken situation. I need Jesus to touch me right now. Now, saints, you're all up around the front, and I can see that your heart is turned toward Jesus. I want you to reach out to somebody. I want you to connect with somebody. I want you to bless somebody. I want you to begin to pray and say, you know what, there's room in my life for me to believe that God's gonna heal 
and God's going to deliver and God's going to bring about transformation and restoration. Yeah. Bring that broken dream. Bring that broken heart. Bring that broken circumstance and situation. Bring it today. Go ahead. Let the Holy Ghost activate that anointing. Come on, bring that brokenness. Come into the house of the Lord and say, I know why I'm here now. I know why I went through everything I've gone through. It's to heal the broken. It's to be used of God to burn Messiah in somebody's life. That's why I'm here. Then you can get through anything. You can go through anything. The darkness will not overwhelm you. The pain will not stop you. The tragedy, the past. Self-pity won't stop you. Nothing will keep you from your destiny. stop church don't quit something's happening in the house something's moving in the spirit (laughs) you're not rejected because you're struggling You're not rejected because you're dysfunctional. You just got to make room for the healing touch. Clear some stuff out of the way. I got to get to my Jesus. Saints of God, no matter where you're at, if you come up here, I need people praying all over this house. There are people seeking the Holy Ghost. There are people that are in need of so many things. I need you to help me. Come on back. Come on back to Jesus. Welcome home. We're glad to have you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Go ahead and believe it. Oh, yes. Jesus loves you. Yes, he does. It's easy to get through it when you know why you're here. I know why. I know why. It's to help you find Jesus. It's to help you. 
I want you to lift up your voice, saints of God. I want every dream that God has ever deposited, every prophetic word that God's ever deposited into your spirit, from whomsoever it came forth from, that seed remains in your life. And I want to activate that seed. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to cry out to God and say, Awaken that anointing in my life. Awaken that anointing in my life. I might be tired. I might be worn. I might have made a thousand mistakes. But I'm coming to heal, to be healed so I can function and operate in the kingdom according to your purpose. We can't lose our why. We can't lose why we're here. If we lose that, we've lost everything. Oh, God. That's it. Believe it. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lay hands on them. Believe God for a miracle. Believe God for supernatural deliverance. Release it in this house. Loose it in this place. Let it be. Let it be according to your will. Ha! Woo! Right now. Right now. According to your purpose. According to your plan. I'm going to activate it. I'm coming because I know why I'm here and I know what I'm about. Yes, you're going to be reproached, but it's worth it. It's worth being reproached. People are going to say you're not sincere. It's fine. That's it. Go ahead. Right there. Holy Ghost is moving. Holy Ghost is working. The Lord is blessing right here. <laughs> Somebody's getting a dream reawakened. A purpose, a prophetic word that's lied, that's laid dormant for so long. You felt like there was no hope. believe it. Go ahead and claim it right now. Let the Holy Ghost flow through you. Let the power of God work in you. Let the name of Jesus be glorified. Ha. Yes. Yes. I serve a God who can do it. I serve a God who is able Amen and amen. Yes. Trust in him. Trust in him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I feel that restoration coming on you right now in the Holy Ghost. Sister Butterfield, I feel it all over you right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost and fire. Oh, yes. Make room. <laughs> 